the last session of, of today. Thank you to all of you to be um, here with us um, because we have different people from different places all over the world. Um, and uh, we are going to, to, to have that a nice discussion around the future of human rights. Uh, you all know that, uh, certainly I'm sure that you all know that uh, next week, next Monday, uh, we'll have the 46th um, session of the Council of Human Rights here in Geneva, uh, Switzerland. And uh, human rights is uh, a question that, a uh, topic that is raised often before the pandemic, but more than ever it's raised uh, because some countries, governments, entities are taking advantage of the pandemic to uh, increase their control on human rights. So we, we're lucky to have all of you gentlemen and lady. So um, I will maybe ask you all to introduce yourself and also maybe give a flavor about what you think about the politicization of human rights the last couple of uh, years and how you see the evolution and the future so I'll, I'll start with uh, Kekashan. Uh, so if you could unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about, because it's an informal exchange, you know, I'll go around and, and then we, we, we'll exchange a bit on, on the topic. Sure. Hello, everyone. It's very lovely to be here today. And it's wonderful to e meet all of you. My name is Kekasha. I am a United Nations Human Rights Champion and Founder President of Green Hope Foundation, as well as a Forbes 30 Under 30, a National Geographic Young Explorer. And in 2016, I was awarded the International Children's Peace Prize for my work on children's rights and sustainability. So I have been working in the field of human rights and sustainability for about 12 years now and this is my entire life and you know it's been more than seven decades since that day in on 10th December 1948 when at the historic UN General Assembly session in Paris the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted uh, with the uh, resolution 217a and article one of this momentous document gloriously states and I quote that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. But seven decades and one global pandemic later, I think we are as far away from realizing this dream as we were then, because even today in so many parts of our world, humans are not born free. And even as I speak, girls are aborted every day in the womb, in countless refugee camps, whether it is uh, Tigray in Ethiopia or in the Beka Valley on the Lebanon-Syria border or in Kutupalong, the world's largest refugee camp to over a million Rohingya refugees. Children are born in bondage, many not surviving beyond that first week. And as someone who works in these camps, I see firsthand the yawning gap that exists between the haves and the have nots of our world. And the pandemic has once again demonstrated this unequal impact of disasters on those who are vulnerable and pushing them further into the mire. And Catherine, you asked about the future of human rights. And I think that the future of human rights depends on what measures we take to address the fundamental causes of inequality that exist in our society. And it needs to move away from being a neoliberal concept where those who are in power already living in exalted states determine at their leisure what freedom should look like for those whom they exploit. And the most vulnerable, most of the vulnerable communities that I mentioned earlier, they're not even aware that they have any rights. So how can they ask for them? So the first step uh, towards empowerment and equality is education. We need to create that level playing field where all participants have the same enablers, but to do so, we need effective policies and more importantly, 
political and economic will to implement them. And just very quickly, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the SDGs that offers this blueprint of prosperity, people, and planet addresses these deficiencies. But with the agenda already off track, when with the devastating impacts of COVID-19, I think that it has further diminished the prospects for achieving the SDGs with obviously the greatest impacts falling in on countries and people least able to protect themselves and already at the greatest risk of being left behind. So we are not in the most ideal situation right now, but we, I can, and then we can talk about this later during the panel, but we can definitely use this pandemic as an opportunity to rebuild better where human rights and sustainability are concerned so that we do not go back to normal that brought about this pandemic and the state of inequality and increased inequality, but actually create a just and equitable world where no one is left behind. Back Thank you, you Kekashtan. So I'll turn now to you, Yul Anderson. Thank you very much for having me. Um, this panel is especially uh, timely in the instance that here in the United States, we're celebrating Black History Month. So here in the United States, we're looking at all the achievements of Black Americans and associating that back to uh, the civil rights movement, and then um, equating that to the Black Lives Matter movement. And then um, I personally um, look at African-American and African trends and um, cross-correlate that with um, other um, impacts around the world. And what we see is that most of the world uses the Black American experience as the catalyst of what civil rights movement should look like. And so I just think it's great that I'm here and, and able to share that with you today. Um, the other thing I think um, Akasha um, was talking about, um, I think she was hinting to um, the social contract in the instance that um, governments um, owe a responsibility to the citizens that they govern and that there is a give and take that um, you know um, civil society is willing to give up certain types of rights in order to be protected by those that um, govern us. And so it's in those instances where the contribution and the adherence to those contracts break down that we see incidences like COVID-19 running amok uncontrolled, or we see um, Black Lives Matter movements, um, or we may even see more Arab Springs um, erupting all across the globe. So what I would say as far as the future of human rights goes is, is that when the United Nations Declaration was uh, put forward um, after World War II and, and in the origin originations of um, human rights um, opportunities given the social contract, that uh, modern day technology and the internet of things has um, disrupted um, everything that anyone had thought of. And that um, prior to the internet of things, there was no idea that there would be a semblance of power sharing. No one thought about power sharing when these documents were committed um, and written. And now um, power sharing is on the table. Um, it's being demanded. Um, the computer and the internet makes it possible. Um, and so I just see that um, if we do not um, change the paradigm um, and adjust it to uh, modern day technologies that we're just going to see more disruptions, um, more um, class wars, more uprisings, and again, um, as we saw in some of the other um, panels, uh, more environmental viruses being released, uh, whether man-made or naturally being released, released as a combative um, defense of man's um, impact on nature. And, and that just ties into climate change, right? So the more we disrupt nature, the more we're gonna suffer. Um, I go our, uh, alphabetical um, order. So Saulo Baia. I would like to say that it is wonderful to stay here and uh, uh, share all these this ideas in our discussions. And uh, we are discussing how abstract, abstract concepts can acquire power to transform society and try to anticipate the next stage in social progress and try also to imagine how to facilitate and accelerate the transition to the future. Uh, 
when you talk about uh, sustainability, education, peace, these concepts are already old partners of uh, human rights professors. I teach human rights, I'm federal judge, and I'm also a professor at the Federal University of Bahia. And uh, there is an idea from Karol Vazak, a Czech that lived in France, and he wrote 1979 about uh, human rights generations and based in the ideas of the French Revolution. The first one, the, the liberty, civil, political rights. Second one, equality, the social and economic human rights. And the third one was the fraternity, solidarity, sustainability is linked with this. Some others imagine uh, like an historic uh, process, uh, the fourth one, the Italian Norbert Bobbio talked about the fourth generation. And he put uh, all the genetic rights and bio, bio law and so access to information, digital world and so on. But this idea of the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one was very highly criticized between uh, political scientists, lawyers, uh, people involved with law, uh, because uh, uh, each human rights in each generation has uh, different uh, levels of depth, of extension, of efficacy of re re reality. So the idea is not exactly uh, understand the all with a, a historic uh, succession, but uh, we can talk, uh, we need to talk about the dimensions of each uh, generation of uh, the, the human rights related to legality, human rights related to to uh, liberty and so so we, we speak today more about dimensions uh, we talk about the death we talk and each in each uh, kind of dimension we can find new human rights new fields in each generation and then we can talk about what kind of human rights will constitute our future. Yesterday, uh, I, I have been uh, here all the talks, and we saw you know, Monday, on Monday uh, a wonderful discussion in a panel about the human right to reliable information. That is a new dimension of the first generation. Or, and uh, yeah, yesterday, I saw also the human rights for global democracy, effective democracy, real participation at the political life. And I can bet it for our future or for the future of human rights too. And my bet here now uh, was the right to live in a multicultural ambience. Uh, I, I like to discuss this kind of thing. Migrations and communications created a no return point. Cultures are interacting. And it is absolutely necessary to reject the idea of cultural universalism. It's the same thing as assimilationism or monoculturalism. And we cannot disconsider particularities, social and cultural identities at all. So let's put this idea of, uh, of universalism at, at our side. In the same way, uh, it's not necessary or it's necessary to avoid the idea of applied culturalism in a broad sense. It's the same thing as cultural relativism with a total tolerance. If we have uh, different cultures, we can put all together and live together 
but uh, this kind of things created the apartheid. The apartheid is a consequence of cultural relativism. I advocate the idea of multiculturalism at the strict sense where it is necessary a relative tolerance and identify national common values or, or in each country, universal global common values, not national global common values. So we have to, to understand that, that it's necessary to identify one common identity, one common culture in some best basic aspects for the social coexistence. I believe that we need to, to, to try to, to, to find a common uh, goal or a common understanding about uh, uh, women's rights, about uh, a lot of things. And we cannot uh, live together if we don't have a common basis about the human rights, women rights. And uh, it's very, it's, it's uh, in my sense, the idea of uh, multiculturalism. It's necessary, we need to identify the essential traits in common mankind in each of us and lie and live with them. It's my, my small contribution today. Thank you very much by your attention I, yeah, for the discussion. Okay, thanks. The floor now to, go, to Goran. Goran, please. I'm professor at the University of Zagreb. I'm associate uh, member of the uh, World Academy and I'm full member of the Global Young Academy. Uh, thank you for this invitation to have this, uh, to attend to this panel. Uh, human rights are one of the fields where I'm very active in my academic uh, world, work. Um, and you know, when I, when I thought what we will discuss actually um, about human rights and the future of human rights, uh, of course we can be concentrate on the near future or to be concentrate on the future in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. So, so-called to prediction of human rights. But uh, um, both of those uh, possible discussions are more than welcome. Uh, but I will be concentrate mostly on the topic in this introductory, uh, 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 introductory note. I will be concentrate on the topic of COVID-19 and the influence on human rights. Um, human rights are key in shaping uh, the pandemic response because responses that are shaped by and respect human rights result in better outcomes in beating the pandemic, ensuring healthcare for everyone and preserving human dignity. According to this, we have to be focused especially on three human rights issue in time of this pandemic. Uh, two of them belong to the fundamental rights, right to live and duty to protect life, the right to health and access to the health care. And the, one of the central challenges is freedom of movement. A right uh, to live and duty to protect life is probably one of the most fundamental human rights we know and all states have a duty to protect it. The right to health and access to the healthcare is direct connected to the right to li life. Both of those rights are in front line in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. Freedom of movement is somehow controversial. Uh, for the human rights lawyer, as me and all of you here, that is, of course, not controversial at all, but in social uh, movements in uh, our media, uh, sometimes we ask, we have the questions, is this really freedom of movement and can the freedom of movement be restricted? And that is a reason that is a freedom of movement, a central challenge in this fight against COVID-19 pandemic. States massively, as we all know, introduce some of measures as a lockdown or rule stay at home. 
Those measures have direct impact on jobs, livelihoods, access to food, water, electricity, healthcare, education. Of course, international law recognizes this restriction of freedom of movement that it should be very direct connected to the goal to stop spreading COVID-19 virus. And in the same moment, it should be proportional and non-discriminatory. Uh, this pandemic period is very rough, period in which number of human rights, including fundamental ones, are violated. For that reason, United Nations published already few documents and I will mention only one document connected to human rights and COVID-19. It's published uh, in April 2020 and wrote six key human rights messages to all states. The first is protection. Protection people's lives is priority. The second, the virus does not discriminate, but it impacts do. Involve everyone in your response. For the treat is virus, not the people. Fifth, no country can be eat that alone. And the last one, when we recover, we must be better than we were before. With this message to the all states made by United Nations, I will conclude my introductory note. And I'm really uh, happy to continue discussion with you. Thank you, Goran. I would I would add also that COVID nineteen is affecting the access to information. Access sure. to information. That's very true. Yeah, yeah. You know, That's very it true. is it is a very uh, a very important point, and particularly for us. I mean, working for the press, uh, we we see uh, a restriction of the access to information. And, and, and it is a problem. So uh, I now turn to Marcin. Thank you for having me in this panel. It, the topic is very provocative, the future of human rights. Uh, we tend to think, well, willing, uh, living in democratic countries that uh, well, the future is obvious. There is, there is future for human rights. And when we look uh, into the world, outside world, uh, we of course see that there is so much to do uh, in, in terms of um, human rights protection. I would not like to uh, focus on the others because we could always point out to different corners of the world to say uh, that there is so much to do in terms of protection of human rights. But in this uh, short speech that I would like to give now, I would like to look at ourselves and is the situation as good as we tend to think or as most of the societies in democratic countries tend to think uh, in terms of human rights protection? In other, in other words, uh, is the situation in terms of protecting of human rights in our democratic countries looking good? And uh, I would like to point out to two uh, main issues there are destabilizing our perception of uh, are we really so uh, advanced in protection of human rights and are we really in the position of those that can actually say to others how human rights should be protected and there's two issues that i would like to point out to are inequalities and uh, the changes of the climate Samuel Moyne, in his recent book, Not Enough, is pointing out that a human rights movement, who, which developed after the Second World War especially, was too much paying attention. Of course, that was good at that point. Uh, too much attention to civil and political rights, later on to social uh, cultural rights. And also, there was, you know, the second generation is also pointing to the economical rights. But the human rights movement was really focused on the first generation of human rights 
and the protection of freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion. But, and well, we were also in, in less, especially in European countries, focusing a lot in developing social democracies on social, cultural and economical rights. But as we know, not all the democratic countries sign up to protect these rights. And there are crucial democracies in the world like United States, there are not uh, signatures of uh, the convention. But economical rights are crucial if we want to enjoy the right to uh, public participation, to, act, to be active in, in the public sphere, uh, to run for offices, actually to be present in the public sphere in terms of uh, being allowed to speak uh, and have time to make up our minds uh, what the, the world should look like. In, in other words, if we want to speak and use freely the, our right to free speech, we have to be knowledgeable about the world. But how can we be knowledgeable if we cannot put a, our life together in terms of economical uh, situation, financial situation, and it's very hard for us or for some to um, you know, support their life from the first day of the month till the last day of the month. And uh, with time, huge inequalities grew. And this is now something which is discussed in so many different um, pieces of literature. Uh, I would also like to point out to Branko Milanovic book about inequalities, Thomas Piketty book about inequalities which are present in our democratic societies. Our societies are so much divided in terms of economical standing of the members. And of course, without a proper standing, huge portions of our societies cannot enjoy social, cultural rights, but also first generation of human rights. So inequalities are a huge uh, challenge. And that's why Samuel Moyne is pointing out in his book that what we have achieved within democratic societies, within democratic countries, in terms of a protection of human rights is not enough. But there is also another element which uh, now impacts if we would like to overcome the inequalities, which is the climate. Uh, in his recent report, Philip Alston, UN Special Rapporteur, uh, pointed out that poverty is so much linked with climate changes. And he's pointing out to the poverty which exists within European states. And he was writing and preparing individual reports on U US or UK, which frustrated so many of the people within these countries because the reports presented that a huge portion of the societies in these democratic countries, but also in others, live under the, the, uh, the line of poverty. 20% of the British living under the line of poverty is a huge number. And usually we don't think about them and, and governments don't talk about them. So all these people, because of you know, not having enough of financial wealth, you know, and financial situation, a good situation, cannot enjoy their rights, uh, human rights, uh, the first generation or the second generation. But poverty is also the issue that exists in the third, in, in other countries, in Africa, in, in Asia. And this poverty is very much created also now due to the climate change. People cannot develop their, their economies, develop agriculture because of the rise of the temperature. And there are several sources and data comes from different corners of different scientific areas that the temperature is growing and there is a huge problem with, uh, with the rise of um, the temperature and the global warming. So the global warming and the, the rise of the temperature uh, is a huge also issue that can impact the human rights uh, that we enjoy. And the right to 
clean air and the right to a health environment is the third generation of human rights. And uh, But we look at this third generation so often as something as, as in addition to the first generation and to the second generation. First generation we consider to be the first, the most important. But how can we really enjoy, as I was really saying at the very beginning, freedom of speech, freedom of association, running for offices, if we cannot put together our lives in economical standing, and if our weather and our climate doesn't allow us even to, uh, to prosper and develop in the condition in which we live. So as we can see, the, first, the enjoyment of the first generation is so much linked to the second generation of human rights, and it's so much linked to the third generation of human rights. The third generation is not a new development, which is new, which is uh, less important than the first and the second. And this is the main point that I want to make during my presentation. The third generation of human rights, especially the right to clean environment is crucial if we want to enjoy the first generation of human rights and the second. In other words, we have to care in our democratic societies, but not only, but especially we who are the, the, the creators of the most of the pollution in the world, the Germany, France, Poland, from where I am, where we use coal to the big, huge extent, United States, and, and I don't want to mention China, but of course, China is also a great polluter. We all have to put our hands uh, on the matter and really deal with the way how we you know, develop as, as developed countries using coal and other sources that, uh, uh, of energy that may not be good for the environment. Because, they, in, because what we do hugely impacts the climate, the weather, and the enjoyment of the human rights. In other words, what I want to say is that for the future, we really have to look for the first generation, second generation, and the third generation of human rights as human rights that we have to deal all together with. In other words, our plate is full and we cannot only focus on the first generation and be happy with it and say, we are a democratic country because we have freedom of speech and freedom of, of, of association and freedom of religion. That's not enough. We because, and other countries can say, we have the first and the second, but that's also not enough. Caring for the rights from the first and the second generation is not enough. We also have to care for the third generation of human rights and care, taking care for all of the three all together can really uh, allow us to care for human rights in general, for human beings, for other people, so that they can live in a clean environment, healthy environment where they can put together their lives, enjoy the, their right to, uh, to work, when they can work, when they can uh, earn, uh, their financial um, um, and for and to to finance themselves and actually in later on to enjoy also their their right to be present in the public sphere if well the time will allow them uh, thanks to the work that they will have in other words they should also not be occupied with you know putting their life together and only focus on work and not to have some leisure time. Uh, and, and some free time to actually be uh, active participants in the public space, space, be citizens who can also find time to speak out, to make up their minds, to be present in the public. That's uh, all what I would like to say, but also at the end, what should we do uh, if we have a full plate, first, second, and the third generation that we should care for all together? Well, we can look to the states. This is a traditional uh, way to look at the states as and the, the governments, which are responsible for human rights protections. But also, uh, these are not only governments who change from time to time. We have also courts, and the and the climate litigation is now um, a big issue. 
and we can often rely on the court's decisions who are making sure uh, the judgments who are making sure that the state comply with the obligations that they agreed on uh, so we can see the courts in democratic countries as supporters in terms of uh, making sure that the three generations of human rights are uh, a main focus but we should also look into corporations corporations are, as big entities that create the environment and the surrounding and, and the situation in which we exist. Corporations should also be the ones uh, who are uh, considered to be responsible. And a good movement into the direction to include corporations as the ones that should care for the, for the, for, for, for the environment, for the people, for the health, uh, it's already ongoing since 12 and 2011, since uh, UN guiding principles on human, uh, on business and human rights uh, became uh, a fact. Now European countries are all working to implement the guiding principles in their, into their legal systems. Uh, but of course, uh, the issue is to make them go and uh, to, 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 to develop, <coughs> I'm sorry, to develop their approaches, their corporate governance regimes uh, in a, a proper pace uh, so that uh, they will really make an impact uh, on, on the situation uh, in which they exist, not only caring for their shareholders but also caring for all the stakeholders i would end here maybe we can add uh, later on is uh, a little bit more during the uh, conversation during the q a uh, but i wanted just to make uh, these two points that the first second and the third generation of human rights we should uh, care for all together and that there is no one that is more important than the other and the second point that we should look for states, uh, governments and courts. Uh, and here are the ones that can help in dealing with these um, issues that are uh, you know, present in our world, inequalities and climate change. But also we should also include corporations as the entities which are huge leverage and a huge impact that they create in the world as the ones that should also care for human rights. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Marcin, uh, for your presentation. And, and I would um, just, um, what you said, you highlighted also climate, poverty, and it reminds me um, what um, the new president of the Human Rights Council said yesterday. It's Ambassador Khan. Uh, she is the ambassador of Fiji Islands uh, at United Nations in Geneva. It is the first time in history that you have an island nation that is elected as president of the, the council. Um, and, such, uh, and, and she explained to us yesterday that uh, the perspective of human rights can be different uh, from one country or another because it depends also of the, the problems that they have to face. Um, a small islands have to face the impact, the direct impact of climate change when they are in fact the ones that are the less polluting <laughs> the world, but they assist every day to uh, the islands uh, that are in fact surrounded not only by water, but more and more you have water surrounding their territory and they are losing in fact that territory. And um, about the promotion uh, about human rights, uh, I would like to go back also what she said yesterday that it should be more understanding and more uh, pacific, you know, the, the relations between, because we've seen the last couple of um, human rights council, a lot of aggressivity uh, between the countries, China, Russia, uh, United States that left the council, United States that's now back. Uh, in fact, reintegrating the council for the, the coming session that starts on Monday. Um, so it is true that, um, that we need to be, I think, more humble and more um, understanding 
uh, what's happening um, around us, not selfish. Winston, share with us about human rights. First of all, I've been a human rights activist since I was a teenager. So I've been doing this for, the, for a very long time. Uh, and in my professional years, I became a professional academic. So I taught and developed human rights programs all over the world. So that's essentially where, where I am. Uh, let me just uh, take two thoughts, first of all. My current writings focus on the idea that there is a core interdependence between peace and human rights. If you diminish peace, you will diminish human rights. If you diminish human rights, you will enhance war. So the core interdependence between peace and human rights are an important connection uh, that we as human rights adv advocates ought to keep in mind, because the more we emphasize you human rights in human relations, uh, uh, the better the chances are of sustaining peace as well. Uh, now, uh, there are two other thoughts that I can add to this. Um, the important goals of peace and human rights, it seems to me, are not complicated. Uh, one, we need to seek to universalize the principle of human dignity because human dignity is the core of human rights and the core of peace. Second, to give human dignity some uh, sustenance, uh, we need to universalize uh, the principles of human rights. And these two ideas are the cornerstone of the whole idea of the future of human rights, but I'd also add the future of peace. Now, just a few thoughts about background. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was largely the inspiration of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, is certainly one of the most brilliant documents of the modern age. Uh, if you look back for a moment at the effort to constrain law by reason, uh, what we find is that uh, there's little codified. There's no natural law code. In fact, I could find only two real rules that endured over hundreds and hundreds of years, and that was the rule Audi alteram partem, that is, hear the other side, and the rule Nemo judex in sua causa, a judge should not be sitting as a judge in his own course. Those are the only two things until we got to the point where we actually developed literally a code of natural rights, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So the declaration itself was almost an intellectual miracle in that sense. Uh, now, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the roots of that, of course, were came from the Atlantic Charter, uh, which Churchill and uh, Roosevelt agreed to. And the Atlantic Charter stipulated the war aims of the Allies. So in some ways, the outcome of the Universal Declaration was an outcome of the war aims of the Allies. And those were political freedom, freedom of speech and expression, religious freedom, freedom of conscience and belief, freedom from want, economic freedom, and freedom from fear, security, okay? Those four rather brilliant ideas, I don't know who in the Roosevelt administration cooked them up, but they became uh, the background for the development of the first real constitutional system we ever had, the United Nations Charter, and the beginnings of the first Bill of Rights we ever had at the global level, that is to say, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was supplemented by the Co Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Covenant on Social, Cultural and Economic Rights. Uh, so so we, ha we have that, uh, the, the core of this comes from the four freedoms for which we fought. 
Um, now, just a few further points. Um, uh, the the, um, uh, the the amazing thing about the Universal Declaration is that it's a short document, you know. And if you add the two covenants, it's still very short, which constitutes what we call the International Bill of Rights. But if we review the human rights documentation from that time to now, we have a huge volume. I mean, uh, 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 humanity has been prolific in developing human rights issues for the climate, for health, for a dozen other things, getting rid of gender discrimination, trying to get rid of racial discrimination, and so on. Uh, so in a sense, uh, there's been an almost organic growth of human rights from those, those beginnings. And why this is amazing is that when the Universal Declaration was adopted, the states were very clear that these rights were not enforceable rights. And the first thing the international community did was they enacted uh, covenants or treaties that would try to make as much of it enforceable as possible. Now, the question is, what, what's the problem here? This is a problem that most people forget, most international lawyers forget, most political scientists forget. It's a problem with a very common word, sovereignty. In 1648, we developed the Treaty of Westphalia, which changed the political order so that it was now sovereign states that were the key players. Only sovereigns could make war, et cetera, et cetera, you see. But what we also did was we made the sovereigns absolute or near absolute. And what made this even worse was the big theorists of the 19th century were so attracted to this idea of sovereignty that they set up a whole theory of jurisprudence and law which said only the sovereign can make law, no one else. So now if you ask the question, where's the sovereign making law internationally? Well, we're not sure that the UN Charter is really a sovereignty charter. Uh, if the UN doesn't have the sovereignty power, how can they make human rights law? And then some states are saying, well, you know, unless we specifically adopt it as sovereign law, it's not law. China is the leading exponent of this theory, okay? So we still have some ambiguity about, shall we say, the enforceability the element of the international legal obligation that attends all of human rights and all of peace. Peace has become discretionary. We've got five permanent members in the Security Council. If one vetoes, the war goes on, you know? Peace is fragile, human rights are fragile, and still there is an enormous effort, both the civil society, to promote and sustain peace and the civil society worldwide to promote, sustain and expand the concept and meaning of human rights for all human beings. Okay? So if you ask me what our problem is, we've got conventional sovereignty, unaccountable and, and, and not wanting to be accountable. We haven't really unpacked what it really means and we have the people. The UN Charter talks about we the people. And it's quite clear what the people want. They want peace, okay? They want human rights universally. They want the universalization of human dignity and they want the universalization of human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. So now, Neandro. Well, allow me first to introduce myself. I am Neandro Saavedra Rivano. Um, I am a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. And uh, currently, I am a visiting professor at the University of Brasilia. 
Um, I was for a long time a professor at the University of Tsukuba. Now I am Professor Emeritus uh, there. Well, um, I want to focus them more in a particular um, aspect of, uh, of human rights. And um, being a sort of futurist, I have written actually several papers uh, on future scenarios. Uh, um, I will focus uh, not on the medium term, but I will focus more on the on the long term, looking towards the end of this century. And the, um, the aspect that I want to focus on is the rights of the um, aged people. Um, so I will start also with the observation that uh, as we look to history and even daily events, um, respect for human rights cannot be taken for granted. Um, all the time <clears throat> they are being threatened and um, this is, um, well, of course I, I share the view uh, that Winston just um, told us about uh, the people wanting peace, but the people is very general. Uh, actually, the threats to human rights, they come from some people, um, affecting other people's rights. Um, so, um, say to lay a background for what I am going to say, let's say that um, human rights are usually uh, the result of frictions among segments of society. And uh, as we look into the future, the world is facing a variety of global crises. Uh, of course, we have the environmental crisis, um, and uh, we also have the aging of society, the demographic crisis. Uh, as we know, society is aging. The proportion of uh, older people is increasing everywhere in all the countries. Uh, if we look at the um, statistics coming from the population division of the United Nations, um, we can see that um, let's say that we, let's define age as being people who are uh, older than 65, 65 or above. So the proportion of age people is expected to go from less than 10% right now to about 16% in 2050 and uh, more than 22% in 2100 by the end of the century. And this trend is even higher for developed countries. Uh, in the right now, it is close to 20%, uh, but by the end of the century, it will be close to 30%. Um, so that, um, of course, that has plenty of economic uh, consequences. Uh, we know the crisis about social security systems in many countries. Um, and one way to look at it is through what economists call the dependency ratio. That means how many, um, the ratio of people, say older people, 65 and above, in relation to those people who are at working age, let's say between 20 and 64 years of age. Um, I can explain to you, um, if we look at right now in, in the world, um, we have that um, for the world as a whole, we have about one old person for six people who are at working age. By the end of the century, that ratio will change um, like two old people for five people of, of working age. And if we look at developed areas, um, that ratio right now is one for three, so one old people for three working people, and it will be by the end of the century um, three people for five, um, three older people for five at working age. So, of course, um, we can looking at the behavior of people, um, people who are at working age will not feel happy um, about that situation because uh, they will have to work a larger portion of their time to help support other people. 
Uh, we also have the child dependency ratio, uh, but I will not enter into that because, because we do not have that much time. Now, um, in the case of the older people, um, in addition to normal economic sustainers, there are also the health care costs, which uh, are much higher. The older people get, the higher the health and caring costs. So we already can see that there are voices that are, that are calling for the limitation of the uh, basic rights of the older people, like uh, right to health and even right to vote. Um, um, because, uh, of course, older people, they are more diligent in going to voting um, polls and uh, they will vote to defend their rights. So if the younger people want to change um, the health uh, or care rights of the older people, uh, they will be very likely outvoted because there will be more and more older people. So here we have a situation that um, is hard to see how it would be solved democratically. Uh, by democratically, I mean in a situation where if one person, one vote. We have already seen some movements in, part, in England in particular, um, asking for limitation of right, uh, right to vote, indicating that after past, uh, after a certain age, people would no longer have the right to vote. Um, of course, that is a very basic uh, human right. Um, so my point is that, uh, I, I explained all this evolving situation, is that we can see in the future, uh, and of course it is changing um, just in front of our eyes, a situation where very basic human rights of the older people will be under threat. Uh, I mean, the right to health, um, the right to vote, and eventually even the right to life. And uh, well, this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank very you, much. Leandro. Very interesting what you said, uh, right? And uh, I would say also the use of elderly people as kind of uh, guinea pigs for vaccination, because um, if you 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 listen to what WHO and the country said at the beginning, the priority for vaccination against COVID nineteen should have begun with health workers but because they were not they are not really sure about side effects and consequences of vaccination i mean it they switch to the elderly because if you you have a certain age and you die they will say oh it's not the vaccine it's because of his or her age it's it's more convenient i would say so um we have um about 15 minutes to go and I'd like to come back to Kekashan, who was in fact the one who opened the door uh, to the future of human rights, because you say that, um, okay, you underlined and you highlighted the importance of education among other things, but you say that maybe um, the COVID-19 pandemic is an opportunity. Uh, so could you say a few words on, on how you see that pure, uh, opportunity, because you have uh, five other speakers uh, after you. So I would like each of you to, to say something very short. So maybe we can make another exchange before um, the end of, of the session. Actually link uh, what I said about COVID being an opportunity and uh, what I mentioned about education to the work that I do. And as a grassroots human rights defender, which I mentioned I've been working on for the last 12 years with the world's most marginalized communities, I feel that, of course, education is the most viable tool for their empowerment. And that is why at Green Hope Foundation, we use education for sustainable development as a tool to provide them with the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to enable them to think and act for a sustainable future and realize that they too have the same rights as their oppressors. And that helps to wipe out the centuries of bias and oppression that have eroded their basic rights to speak and live 
the way they want. And even in the 21st century, when the Western world is abuzz with SpaceX and Hyperloops, there are entire villages and communities who don't have electricity, no clean drinking water, no toilets. And so the first step towards human rights is to ensure that they get access to these basic amenities. And coming to the pandemic, during this pandemic in Liberia, our local Green Hope Foundation chapter implemented a project called Powering Communities through solar, where we've installed solar panels in huts as well as in their local schools. And these will provide light and safe spaces for young people and especially the girls to study, to learn computers, things that we take for granted in the Western world. In the villages of Bangladesh, we built toilets, especially for the girls and women so they don't have to go to the fields to answer nature's call at night and face dangers of abduction, trafficking, or snake bites. And most of these communities actually suffer from arsenic poisoning as their water sources are polluted. And through rainwater harvesting and building deep bore tube wells, we are providing them with alternate sustainable sources, thereby improving their health and sanitation. And what we're doing, especially during this pandemic with the inequalities exacerbated, needs to be magnified and made normal for all of these deprived societies, because sadly, even today, they are the majority. And just very quickly uh, to conclude, I think that while governments and other national stakeholders retain uh, central roles in tackling high inequalities, these are all global problems and decisions that are made you know, by one country have ramifications for others through trade, finance, and investment. And in an interconnected world, national policymaking is increasingly constrained by decisions that are made beyond borders. And so just echoing what some of my fellow panelists said as well, at this critical time, multilateralism is under profound pressure, and yet cooperation among countries remains essential, not least because the consequences of rising inequality do not respect national boundaries. And that is why I say COVID is an opportunity. And as young people, and speaking as a young person, we need to play a larger role as well. And our efforts need to go beyond the protests and strikes, beyond the tokenism that is in fact another way that our passion is exploited. And as the largest stakeholder of civil society and those whose future is most at stake, we need to be the drivers of that positive social evolution, one where human progress is not exploitative, but fair and enshrined in the ethos that every human is equal. So that is how I see the future of human rights and seeing uh, the opportunity that this pandemic has given us to rebuild better. Thank you so much, Kikashan, for this uh, wonderful picture. Yes, I mean, uh, we've never seen that uh, the world is as much interconnected as with the pandemic, because we've seen when you, we, we had the lockdowns, how we are dependent on each other and on other countries. Um, as the, the head of WHO says, if we want to fight the pandemic, if you're safe, I'm safe. We cannot be selfish. You, you spoke about different points. Uh, power sharing was one of also one of the main points of, of your um, uh, presentation. How do you see the future? Black Lives Matter did wake up a lot of people um, in the world. Um, because it started with Black Lives Matter, but um, it, it spread out also to other communities. How do you see the future? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement and the disruptions basically um, have shaken the uh, power barons to their core, which is why um, we're hosting such meetings now to try to figure out what to do in the future. Um, I think um, the laissez-faire attitude of the global community that allowed the United States, China, Germany, and the atrocities in Africa to impose race policies that violate the human rights of the individual um, needs to be addressed. Um, I think the, the, the great equalizer is going to be the Arab Springs. It's going to be um, the new technologies, the iPhones um, that equalize the base and it is going to require a huge um, growth of a global backbone <laughs> for, the, um, for the elite that, that control this uh, world that we live in. 
um, to actually acquiesce um, to a more um, humane, um, interconnected, um, power sharing base. And I think the social contract that um, was advanced by Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau are going to have to be renegotiated. Um, governments are changing. People are getting more power as they're becoming more interconnected. Um, so I, I'm very optimistic. And um, I think that we need to self-police ourselves. As uh, Winston uh, was saying earlier, um, sovereignty is a key issue. But um, now with the opportunity um, to cross over um, you know, arbitrary uh, borders, um, I, I think governments will begin to find that they can't exist um, without the strength, power, and health of all other governments and the citizens uh, that they govern. Thank you, Yul. Thank you so much. Saulo, you also spoke about different things, the common identity, and the difference between, and um, I would say, um, the mission of each generation. And you spoke about fraternity. Fraternity, is it one of the key um, points for the future? Well, of course, we have to develop all the dimensions of human rights. We cannot forget anyone. And uh, fraternity is more one of them. But I'd like to, to resume my, my, my ideas today. Uh, I believe that the biggest challenge for the United Nations system is to convince the East, the Muslims, that uh, there are some common values that must be protected, must, must exist. And it isn't a, a Western imposition only. It's uh, that we need some common basis to live together. Uh, some, uh, some measures against women, against child, children, against boys, against anything anyone uh, must, must respect some basic and minimum level of coincidence in the whole world. If uh, the, the human dignity, as Winston uh, told, must be protected, must be shared by, by each individual in our world, in our planet. And this, this multicultural perspective, all the, the some uh, cultural identities are very important, but uh, they are not uh, absolute. We cannot think it, uh, to live in isolation uh, in our global community. It's my main idea. Thank you, thank you, Katarina. Good thank job. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, uh, respect of the differences is also one of the main points. If we respect it or, or differences, I mean, first of all, uh, it's more interesting <laughs> because... Uh, we but but we, we, we cannot be completely different <laughs> and do what no, we think that we totally have to do. totally di different, but it's also like uh, the president of the Human Rights Council said, it's a question of perspective and what uh, Kekashan said, um, I think in a very nice way also, you have to understand that for us, it is normal to be connected. Look, we are spending, I don't know how long all the day connected, but certain people don't have even electricity. And, and some women are at, at risk because when they want to, to go to the toilets at night, which are outside, I've been, they can be attacked not only in their community, but in, in uh, refugee camps. Um, so there are certain aspects of the life of a, a, a huge group of people that we have tendency to forget. Uh, yesterday, it was the 10th anniversary um, of the, uh, the conflict in Syria. I mean, Syrian people were living like you and me, and all in a sudden, their life changed. Some people, um, left their nice houses, apartments to end in refugee camps, in the mud, in the cold, uh, kids not going to school. Um, sometimes we have tendency to forget about how fortunate you, we are and how uh, we should um, give a little bit of our time and our energy um, and our love and care 
um, to the others in order to, to, to also transmit a good message to people of the age of uh, Kekashan, because I think we are there to show them the way and the good, the good path. Uh, Goran, you, you had a lot of, um, of um, points uh, that you already shared uh, with us before. So what is your view for the future? Are you optimistic? Oh, this is really, you know, this difficult question. Um, you know, I'm actually very lucky we are talking today about future of human rights. But in reality, we have a lot of problems with uh, our past. Um, every day we can um, see, again, we fight again and again for um, some human rights we adopted decades ago. Uh, discrimination is actually everywhere. Uh, we have to fight again um, against racism or nationalism. Uh, we have to fight uh, again for women, ri women rights, uh, LGBT rights, refugee rights, migration rights, migrants' rights. Um, actually, uh, when I see what we have everything done, um, on the paper, everything is perfect. But the implementation is not good. And I'm really not satisfied with the implementation of human rights. Um, almost in any country, in every country, you can see some discrimination. Um, of course, next to those old human rights, we have some new human rights dimensions um, connected with uh, some other new challenges like climate change. And here I'm with you, Katrin. Uh, because, you know, you mentioned already attack on journalism. And I think that is uh, one of the main problems in the moment, because we have this problem with uh, misinformation, with uh, fake news, and this is everything connected with the human rights. Uh, people, they need to have right to have right information. And in the moment, they don't have it. Uh, it is confusion. We have a lot of information. And, you know, it is actually not the point that somebody wants really we believe in all those lies, all those fake informations. They actually only want to make us confused by all those information. So we don't trust to any information. And that is, uh, from my point of view, one of the main challenges for the future of human rights, really to find somebody we can trust. That is the problem. And um, in the middle of a pandemic, all governments, what, East, West, whatever, they want to control because they want to control their population in order to show that they're handling well the pandemic. And that's sometimes, right. yeah. And that's the, the, the reason also what, why you have that huge increase of infodemic. So a lot of information and it's very difficult to, to, to check. And even as a professional, it is difficult to check. So it, it is even more difficult for average people to, to have access to information. And we've seen it um, with all the elements that all of you spoke about in, in the different regions you are based or the different topics like uh, Black La uh, Lives Matters, uh, that also manipulation of, of images in order to provoke uh, hate, to increase differences. And um, because like that, if people are fighting together, I mean, they're not thinking and, and they're not looking in the good direction. It's easy. Uh, I'll turn now to Marcin. Marcin, you, you, you spoke a lot about uh, um, climate change. Yes, you addressed the problem. So how do you see the future? Is, is uh, climate is one of the main topic that is discussed now, um, the SG, the, um, Secretary General of the uh, United Nations, Antonio Guterres, um, released a report today um, about uh, climate uh, with UNEP. And he's going to, to talk about that topic. It will be the major point for uh, running for a second mandate. So how do you see, are you optimistic too? Well, I am an optimist in general. So I would say I am an optimist. And uh, by listening to other presentations, I can say there was optimism in all of us here and uh, energy and especially pointing out to the people as the factor of change. 
I have mentioned in my presentation that what we can do to strengthen the protection of human rights, and I was pointing out to the states, uh, governments and the courts within the states, but also I was pointing out to corporations. But I should add additional element, which is crucial, the people. And I think it, uh, it, it, was re it resonates uh, and, and it was present in all the other presentations today. The, the putting a, a strong um, accent on the people and the fact that they are more knowledgeable, uh, they are more empowered nowadays, especially the young people who are also, for example, uh, um, pointing our, our attention to the climate change. Uh, and then we remember the, uh, the movement and presence of the young people on the streets uh, of so many different uh, countries um, pointing out that the climate is changing and that this, the, in other way, that their future is changing and that we can deal with that future nowadays, today, and that their time is ticking, that the clock is ticking. So the people uh, is, are the ones uh, who are more and more empowered. And of course, some are not. Some do not have access to so many different resources, and, but uh, we are but we are, and we can speak up and we can uh, build associations and we can build movements and we can uh, actually also uh, get into the important positions and, and um, advocate uh, for taking all these um, uh, issues that we discussed today into the consideration to uh, make a better future. I would like to finish with saying that, uh, as uh, uh, Yul was pointing out, we need a new social contract. We have to rethink the contract on which our societies are based. Uh, we should get out from the perception that growth and profit is what should determine our future. Uh, and so it's not only GDP, growth and profit, that should uh, be the primary in uh, in uh, in the focus uh, on the, or let's say in the foreground. That should uh, I would say that this should be the people and the well-being of the people and the growth and profit uh, should support the people. So this is not uh, the economy that is the main uh, driving force for every one of us and we should adjust. Not what we do which are the tools which should be used for all, of, uh, for all of us in other ways to support the people and make sure that the well-being of the people is the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you, Marcin. Yeah, you're very right. And, and by the way, uh, uh, the um, designation uh, two or three days ago of the new head of WTO, the World Trade Organization. Uh, uh, first time a woman elected at the head of that um, international institution and an African woman. Uh, and she said that one of her priorities was um, also to uh, facilitate the access uh, of, uh, to vaccine to the world, you know, by lifting certain uh, property, intellectual property uh, licenses. So Winston. First want to say that uh, I'm very, very impressed as an old man with the brilliance of the young people who obviously show incredible insights. And to me, this is a, a sense of optimism for the future. Uh, now, if you ask me, I think that the um, putting into force the Universal Declaration of Human Rights generated a momentum globally uh, that no one anticipated. Most of the old guys thought, oh, well, it's not enforceable. It's just a bunch of words over there and nothing will happen. But in fact, it has created a great movement. In my own life, I was a human rights activist in apartheid South Africa. I was on the death list. I escaped with five minutes to spare. Today, 
South Africa has a constitution with human rights at its center. So we are moving forward. When you look at the issue of human rights globally, it's not just the United Nations or the European Union, it's so many regional organizations that have adopted human rights charters. And the interest in human rights is so great that uh, several years ago, the Khoisan people asked me to draft the Bill of Fundamental Rights, the Khoisan people, one of the oldest indigenous peoples in the world. In the Congo, in the Amazon, the Shua nation asked me to draft their fundamental Bill of Rights. In other words, they believed that their future was going to be in human rights. These are some of the oldest um, uh, Aboriginal people in the world. So there is a universality latent in all of human rights. And people are just waiting for the opportunity to give it full expression, whether they're in the Amazon or the Congo or, uh, or, or, or China or wherever. There's a great deal of um, commitment, I think, generally speaking, to human rights. There is the notion of cultural diversity and universality. I think these things will work themselves out. The best of cultural diversity will obviously be a respect for everyone else's diversity. And that is a giant step toward the universalization of human dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. Thank you so much. Neandro, mm -hmm. the last words Merci. will be yours. <laughs> you have been asking everybody whether um, to be optimistic or not. And uh, by nature, uh, optimistic, uh, as I believe uh, everybody here. And uh, But let's say in this case, uh, as we witness events uh, and also we witness past history, um, I would say that I am optimistic in the long run, in the very long run, um, but not very optimistic in the short or medium run. And uh, the reason for that uh, has to do with what I mentioned before in, in, my, in my view, that um, threats to human rights arise from this uh, fracture within society, uh, uh, pressure between different groups. And the crisis, they exacerbate those pressures or they create new pressures and competition for resources. The world is really facing several crises. Well, right now we are living uh, one of them, which is this pandemic, and we can expect more of them to come um, in the future. And uh, as you, Catherine, uh, have said uh, more than once, um, the pan this pandemic has revealed uh, how uh, the behavior of nations, of peoples, governments, um, we can see that, uh, well, African countries have practically no vaccines. Um, distribution of vaccines uh, within countries is, is, um, is very uh, uneven. Uh, so it is a good example of how this crisis has created um, some pressures that are threatening uh, very basic human rights, which is the right to health and the, re the right to life. Um, so we can expect that uh, environmental crisis, for instance, will create uh, more threats to the human rights of immigrants, for instance, uh, because many immigrants will be f flowing uh, from affected countries. Uh, the demographic crisis will not only create the um, threats to the human rights of the um, aged, but also uh, those of immigrants, because population from Africa will overflow into Europe, first of all, and other places later. Um, so it is good, it is easier to be optimistic once the global crisis will be solved, then uh, human rights uh, will be easier to, to handle. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And on do, uh, those uh, words, uh, I would like to to really thank all of you, uh, Keha Kashan, 
for, for your wonderful presentations, thoughts, and being the only speaker, female speaker here, we have to be a little bit more gender balanced in the future. That is uh, something we'll, 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 we'll address. But gentlemen, you've been all great. So uh, it's in fact to, to better congratulate you uh, for also your wonderful participation. And I'm wishing you all a nice evening, day or night. And uh, so long, take care. Bye-bye.